Um, as you know, if you're new here, um, at the beginning of this year, our church started out, we've, we've been going through the entire Bible this year. And how many, no offense to the Old Testament, but how many of you have been going through the reading plan are glad to finally see the words New Testament? Like, finally some words that I can pronounce, right? Finally some stories that make a little bit more sense. But here's, uh, I was talking to someone the other day about it, like, man, I'm so glad to finally be in the New Testament. We've been in the Old Testament, it's good, but it's been a little rough when you get the Judges, and Malachi was a little easier. Um, but here's what's going to happen. If, you, if you've been following along since January, the New Testament is about to really make a lot of sense to you. Uh, because remember what I said in January, the Old Testament is like a drawing. It's the outline. The New Testament puts color to that outline. And so today, I'm glad to finally say we are in the New Testament. So John chapter 1 is what we're going to be looking at. Um, and what I want to what I want to talk about is you know making this transition from Malachi to Matthew. There is a 400 year span time span in there. Okay, uh, we call that the intertestamental period or the silent years. So in, when the Ma- when Malachi ends and Matthew begins with the genealogy, there's 400 years of space. There's a lot of things that happen in 400 years of time. Would you agree? Like our Jamaica team just got back last night. I can't wait to share with you guys what happened over the last seven days here in the United States. And you're going to be really blown away when I tell you what happened in Paris during the Olympics. A lot of stuff happens. And 400 years, you have things like the, the Jewish people start to get their religious system really structured. And then you have this new group that comes in. Remember, those guys are called the Romans. And they have now taken over. They have full empires. And what happens in this 400 years with all of this change the Jewish people kind of leave their relationship with God. They, they, they practice it, and it's just religion, but God's not really God. He's not really personal to them anymore. And so what happens is God just kind of says, you know, just not going to give any more words to the prophets. So for 400 years, God's silent. He doesn't give his word to the prophets to give to the people. But then something happens when we get from, when we get from Malachi in the 400 years span, there is a silence that gets broken with John. And what we're going to see today is that silence being broken, that the silence is going to be broken through the ministry of a guy named John the Baptist. And what I want to show you over these next few moments is I want to kind of show you the birth, the life, and the events, and even the death of John to show you that God is in complete control of everything in our lives. You hear what I say? He's in complete control because a lot of times we can go watch the news and the media and think this thing's out of control. God is still on his throne. That's the thing that the headlines fail to mention, that he is king and he is Lord and he is sovereign and he is in control. And so we're going to see that today, that he is guiding our lives with his hands. So we're going to look at John chapter one. So if you turn your Bibles there, it starts this way in verse 19. This was John's testimony. This is, this is what he's testifying to. This is what I've seen. This is what I've witnessed. He said, this was John's testimony when the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, who are you? I want you to, to just, if you're taking notes, just jot this down. Uh, this word Jew is used over 70 plus times here in the book of John alone. And a majority of the time, when this word Jew, Jews, Jewish is used, it's in a negative uh, content, uh, context. What it's saying is when, he, when John talks about the Jewish people, he's talking about a hostile group of the Jewish people. And this may surprise you. The hostile group are the ones that are running the synagogue. They're, because just a little backstory: the priest that they have sent, they're not Levites. You notice it said the priest... And the Levites, if you remember in the Old Testament, when we walked through this, the only people that were to be priests in the temple were to come from the tribe of, anybody? Levi. These other priests, you know how they got their jobs? The Roman government put them there. They said, hey, we want to, we, our temple needs to be, oh, we'll help you rebuild your temple. But if we rebuild your temple, we want to put the right people in place to run it. Okay. That, that would be like our, our U.S. government appointing who can and who cannot pastor a church in the United States. Okay? How would that go? Let's just move on. 
So this is John's testimony. When the Jews from Jerusalem sent these priests and Levites to ask him, they said, who are you, John? We want to know who you are. And he didn't deny it, but he confessed. I'll tell you what, I'm not. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the one that you think has come. I'm not the anointed one. He says, what then? They asked, are, are you Elijah? He said, no, I'm not Elijah either. Remember, Elijah, he, Elijah goes up into heaven. He never dies. And they think, maybe this is Elijah. He says, I'm, I am not. And he said, are you the prophet? He said, no, he answered. And who are you then? And they asked, we need to give an answer to those who sent us. Listen, we came all this way, and we got to go all the way back. And we can't go back with, no, it was just all no. we got to have an answer. We want to know who you are. So who are you then, they ask. We have to give this answer to those who sent us. What can you tell us about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, just as Isaiah the prophet had said. So what we need to do is we need to break John's life up into two sections. In section number one, we would say this. It would be the purpose of John's ministry. It's the purpose of John's ministry. John came to prepare the way of the Lord, to preach the gospel, to proclaim the Messiah was coming. And that was his job. He, he is a, a prophet. And, and where is he doing this? He's doing this out in the wilderness. Here's what I want you to understand. We, we hear that word wilderness and we think lush trees and greenery. Every time you see the word wilderness in the Bible, it means barren, wasteland, desert, hot, need water. Y'all following me on this? And why is he out in the middle of the wilderness preaching this, and he's not in Jerusalem where all of the people are around the temple? Because John the Baptist is what we call an Essene. And they got fed up with the corruption in the temple, so what they decided was there's a group of them to protect the integrity of the Scripture. The Essenes moved, and they left Jerusalem, and they go out into the wilderness, and they start their own little thing. You ever heard um, of this little thing called the Dead Sea Scrolls? The Essenes. So John is from the Essenes. He had every right because his father worked in the temple. John could have stayed and automatically had a job based off of relationship because of who his dad was. He could have worked in the temple. But instead, they left the corruption. They go out. He's in the wilderness, in the desert, barren wasteland. And the Bible tells us in Matthew 3.3, 3, it tells us that about John the Baptist. He says, for this is who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, when he said the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Isn't it, how, what, would, what would it be like if you realized that there was a prophecy from the book of Isaiah that you read and read and read growing up, and you finally realized, wait a second, that prophecy is about me. That would be crazy, right? How many times do you read that? Memorize that. Because as, as a good Jewish boy, John the Baptist would have memorized this. He would have memorized the Torah and the prophets. So he would have known that there's, there's a prophet. And, and, oh, now I, I am that prophet. And so John isn't just preparing the way of the Messiah. What I would say is that John is actually pointing people towards the Messiah. It's not me. It's, it's another one. It's another one who's greater, another one who's going to come, and you're going to know when he's here. If you look at verse 24, it says this. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. These guys are always causing trouble. And as we go through the New Testament, you're going to realize this group of Pharisees, everywhere Jesus goes, they just kind of hang it. They're like tax. You know what? You can't get rid of it. It's always there. It doesn't matter what it is. Interest. And so they're going to be the interest that follows around constantly trying to debunk, try to uh, throw Jesus off of his mission. And so it says that they were sent from the Pharisees. So they asked him, why then do you baptize if you're not the Messiah? Or why do you baptize if you're not Elijah? Or why do you baptize if you're not the prophet? And John says, why well, baptize with water? And John answered them, someone stands among you, but you don't even know him. He's the one coming after me, whose sandal straps, I'm not even worthy to untie. I can't even touch, touch his dirty feet, I'm not even worthy. And all this happened in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Now, Here's what they got upset with. They got upset that John the Baptist is baptizing people, and he's not one of them. Like, what? You're not a prophet. You're not a Messiah. What gives you the right to baptize? The Jewish people actually pioneered baptism. I don't know if you knew this, but baptism was always self-administered. So it wasn't until later on 
that pastors or ministers would start to help assist in the baptisms. Um, we do ours a little bit different. We don't take people and just sling them in the water, right? We go forward. And you, did you hear me say, if you'll kneel, that the kneeling is because when you're, when you're being baptized, it is humility of kneeling and bowing and being cleansed, symbolically being cleansed and saying, I'm, I'm being lowered to death and being raised with new life to Christ. And so this was a self-administered baptism that was happening, but John begins baptizing people. The Jewish people would go down to what they would call a mikvah. And the mikvah was a, a pool, a cleansing pool, and they would go down and they would dip themselves into the water and they would be cleansed and they would come back up. And what's interesting about this, when, before you could go into the temple, you had to go into the mikvah. So if you go to Israel today, you're going to get really bored seeing the same thing over and over and over. Oh, here's a mikvah. Saw it. We're good. Here's another mikvah. Oh, saw it. Because they took this command very seriously. And if you walk down into the mikvah to be cleansed, and on your way back up, I bumped into you, and you hadn't already gone to the mikvah, I got to get back to the inner line and do it all over again, because now I'm unclean. I can't go in the temple. And so they had this baptism. And baptism was always done by immersion. So we have these different denominations that some say sprinkled, some say you got to be dunked. Here, at the end of the day, here, here's the thing. If you didn't know Jesus, you just got wet. So it doesn't matter if you were sprinkled or dunked. But here we do immersion baptism because the word baptism in the Greek is baptizo, which means to be immersed and go under. And so we, we go completely under the water here because this is a picture of God cleansing every single part of us. Now look at verse 29. It says the next day. So this, the, the, the day before, they're coming, they're asking him questions, and they give him a hard time because he shouldn't be doing this. Verse 29, the next day, John saw Jesus uh, coming towards him, and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, this is the one I was telling you about. And after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. He said, I didn't know him, but I came baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to all of Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit from heaven. What is that next word? Like a dove. How many of you always thought it was a dove? It wasn't. So this is, he's using language here because he doesn't know how to describe the Holy Spirit. So the dove is the only thing he knows how to describe it. So there wasn't like a, a real dove there, right? I got, um, I, I did a symbolic baptism in the Jordan. I had a bird too. I had a seagull that was sitting. So Jesus got a dove. I got a seagull. He says, but I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove. And the Spirit rested on him. So what you got to understand is in the Old Testament, the Spirit would come. When, when God would call you and, and would empower you, the Spirit would come upon you. In the book of Acts, what we're going to see is the Spirit doesn't just come upon you. He comes within you. And now he, he dwells and he reigns within your body. And so he says, listen, he, he rested on him. I didn't know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one that you see the Spirit descending and resting on, that's the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God, which is interesting. Because maybe you didn't know that John the Baptist and Jesus were cousins. What would it take for your cousin to convince you that he was the Messiah? Think about Jesus' siblings. What would it take for your brother to convince you that he was the Messiah? He was the perfect one, right? Some of you probably think your sibling was the perfect one. Some of you think that you were the perfect one. But he says, I, I know that this is the fact because the reason I know this is, this is the Messiah because I've been with God, and I've read the prophecies. And the prophecy said the Spirit's going to mark him. He's going to come upon him. And John's saying that he didn't really know who the Messiah was. He, he maybe had a hint at who this may be. But he didn't, wasn't for sure until that spirit came down. And what I want to do is I want to show you what happens when Jesus was baptized. So now we're going we're to look at Matthew chapter 3. And Matthew chapter 3 verse 16 starts this way. It says, after Jesus was baptized. So Jesus has been baptized. Everybody has recognized what has happened. He went up immediately from the water. And the heavens suddenly opened for him. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove. This is the Holy Spirit. And coming down on him, and there came a voice from heaven. This is my beloved son. I take delight in him. Let me ask you this question. At this point, 
Jesus is beginning his ministry. How many people has Jesus healed that we have read about that's been recorded up to this point? None. Why do we feel like we've got to do all this work before God gives us approval? Because he says, Jesus, this is my son who I'm well pleased. Jesus hadn't even done anything yet. He's not done the miracles or anything yet. He says, this is my son. They, they heard. Imagine, we're, just imagine, let's go back a few minutes and we're baptizing and we take Elijah, and we'll use Elijah because it's Elijah. And we're baptizing Elijah, and Elijah comes up out of the water, and we hear this audible voice of God in this room. What would you do? Whoa, <laughs> probably need to walk outside for a minute. Did, you, did I hear something? That the people that were surrounded in the Jordan that day heard the audible voice of God. And when they heard it, they heard God say, this is my son. Now, you can't mistake in that, right? This is my son. I'm pleased with him. I delight in him. So they, they saw it. John saw it, and when he saw it, he knew. This, this is the one. And if you think about John the Baptist up to this point, John has a very large following of people. I mean, he had his own disciples, and they were following him up and down the Jordan as he was preaching the same sermon everywhere he went. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Baptized. Repent, for the kingdom of God. It was just the same old, same old. And people were following because people were sick of the religious system. And they wanted what he had was a relationship with the Father. And they, wanted, they, were, they were longing from the prophecies in Daniel that there was a Messiah that was coming. And so here he is preaching this, and people are following him. And this is a large following. This is why these Levites and these priests went all the way out in the wilderness because they needed to know that we need to, that we need to put an end to this. Remember what they did to Jesus when he had his disciples? They had to put an end to it because they couldn't let the system be threatened. And so John the Baptist has this large following. He's not trying to start a John the Baptist international ministry. He's not working on his New York Times bestseller and do a book tour up and down the Jordan. What he is doing is proclaiming I'm not the one, but there's one who is, and I want to show you who that is. So when Jesus shows up, I love it, John moves out of the way. It's not about him in the moment. He, he gives the spotlight to Jesus. This is the guy that you were looking for. This is the hope. This is everything, every prayer you've answered, every prophecy you read, every word in the Old Testament. This is your guy. I have a friend of mine who's a pastor, and I love what he says it this way. People ask him, he's like, hey, you're, you're a preacher? He said, yeah. He said, uh, they'll look at him and go, you're a preacher? Like, yeah, I'm, I'm the preacher. He said, so you, you're the guy with all the answers. He says, no, I'm, I'm the guy who points you to the guy with all the answers. This is John. I don't have all the answers. This is why it starts out. This is John's testimony. And he's testifying to what he has seen and what he has experienced. And they can't argue with that. And he is testifying that this, this is who this guy is. It's, it's not me. Yeah, I'm going up and down the Jordan. Yeah, we had X amount of people baptized, repenting of sin. People were talking about it. But it's not me. It's this guy. And John the Baptist is pointing to Jesus. And, and here's the other aspect of his life I want you to see. There's a providence of John's ministry. There's a providence of John's ministry. God's providence is working. It's, the providence of God is, is the, the working of his power to uphold our lives, to guide our lives, and to care for his creation. There's provision. We pray for provision. And there, there's this providence that God gives. So in Matthew chapter 11, I know we're jumping a lot of the New Testament. We, we've just been really excited to get the New Testament. But Matthew chapter 11 and verse 1, it says, After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there, and he began to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. And when John was in prison, that's a, that's a long fall, isn't it? You go from preaching up and down the Jordan to being a threat to the religious system and being successful, and you got to baptize Jesus. It's pretty pretty big piece of the resume. And now where's John? He's in jail. And he says, when John was in prison, he heard about, because everybody's talking about what Jesus is doing. It was kind of reminiscent of when other people heard about what John was doing. 
And now he's hearing the stories about what Jesus did. And Jesus has 10 times and upped him. Like, is this dead people? Jesus never preached a funeral because he raised everybody from the dead. And John's hearing these things. And this is what's amazing in verse 3. He sent, John sends his disciples to ask him, to ask Jesus, listen, go ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? How could John ask such a question? Why are you going to send that message to Jesus to find out if Jesus is the one? Like we, I thought you knew. When you were baptizing, you, you knew these things. And out of all the people, John should know that Jesus is the Messiah. And the same man who Isaiah prophesied about, about being the one to prepare the way of Jesus, the same man who baptized Jesus, the same man who heard the audible voice of God, the same one who saw the Holy Spirit come down onto Jesus, is questioning, is Jesus truly the Messiah? And when John asks, are you the one, you have to know where he is. John is in prison. And he's in prison because he called out Herod Antipas for his sin. Let me tell you about this little sin real quick. This can get really weird really fast. King Herod Antipas was married. Say married. He started to be interested in his brother's wife. It's going to be an awkward Thanksgiving. She's cute. They start flirting. And Herod Antipas divorces his wife and marries his brother's wife. Her name was Herodias. And she was atrocious. (laughs) And John the Baptist was all up in their business. This ain't right. You're wrong. You need, you, this needs to end. And Herodias, the wife, hated John the Baptist so much that eventually they like, what do you want for your birthday? I want his head cut off and on a platter. That's what I want. You've ever asked for that gift? And she wanted him dead, but not Herod. Herod believed deep down inside, there's something about this guy, John. Like, he's a godly man. His character is different from everybody else. So Herod just decided, I'm just going to have him arrested. I'm just going to have him arrested. That'll, you know, that'll, that's fine. That'll, that's a compromise. So he has him arrested, and he didn't kill John the Baptist the way that Herodias wanted to kill him. But then the death sentence comes, and he gets word that he's going to have his head chopped off. Now here's, here's the thing about that. John's on death row. His days are numbered. And he sends a message to Jesus. I need to know, are you the one or should I expect someone else? Look what verse 4 says. Jesus replied. Now what was the question? Are you the one, right? He sends his disciples to ask the question. I would think Jesus would say, huh, let me go down to the prison real quick. Let me have a conversation with John. But look what it says. Jesus replied. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. You go tell him all the things that you you are seeing happen. You go tell him about the feeding of the 5,000. You go and tell him about the little girl who was dead, and and I touched her, and she came. Go tell him about the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. Go go tell him these stories. Go tell him the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy, they're cleansed, the, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Go, go tell that to John. In other words, hey, John, hang in there, man. It's going to be okay. It's not going to end like you want it to, but it's going to be okay. And John's question about Jesus is not about his identity. He's asking about his ministry. But the problem is John already knows the things that Jesus is sending him back. He knows that he's done those things. In verse 2, he says, when John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples. The reason he sent his disciples, he just needed assurance that he knew that he knew. How many of you know that there are times you just need assurance? That you know that you know. And Jesus is saying to John, listen, bro, I love you. We're family. But I'm not coming back to you. This is, this is we, so often we talk, we pray the prayer, God, just help us be the hands and feet of Jesus. But we forget that the hands and feet of Jesus were nailed to a cross. Sometimes serving is suffering. And he says, you're, you're going to suffer, man. You're going to die for me in prison. 
Your, your, your ministry is going to be right there. But I can tell you this. Stay the course. Stay the course. Keep believing. Keep doing what you've been called to do. The situation may not look like you want it to, but keep on moving forward. Stay the course. Let me give you some walking points that we would learn from here. You need to trust in God during the good times and the bad times. Because oftentimes we forget about God in the good times. When everything is going well. It's in the bad times. But we need to learn how to trust him during the good and the bad. We take a step back from this and, and, and if we disconnect from the emotion of the story and we ask what happened, here's what, here's what we do know, that John's desire was fulfilled to prepare the way of the Lord, to preach the gospel for people to repent. In other words, he was here because he did what Jesus called him to do and it landed him in prison on death row. And he's here to prepare the way for the Lord, and he did that. And I would love to know how many people in that prison, after he got this message, before he got ahead in life, I'd like to know what happened. I'd like to know how many people converted, how many people repented. And what we, what we recognize is that God's purpose is being fulfilled. Because remember, he said, I want to prepare the way because the blind will see, and the deaf's going to hear, and the gospel's going to be proclaimed. And we see what John actually did was prepare that, and people were open to that. But more importantly, he realized what God had purposed for him came to pass. It didn't just come to pass by the way that John had it planned. God's will came to pass the way that he had it planned. How many of you know his ways are higher than our ways? Like, I think I know what's best, but left to my own devices, I'm self-destructive. Proverbs 29, 21, uh, 19, 21 says this. It's Old Testament. We'll describe it this way. It says, many are the what? Let's say that aloud. Many are the what? Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that will prevail. Many are the plans in John's heart, but it was the Lord's purpose that was going to prevail. Many are the plans in our hearts, but it's the Lord's purpose that will prevail. You and I do not interrupt the goodness of God through our circumstances. We don't do that. We do not interrupt the goodness of God through our circumstances. We interrupt our circumstances through the goodness of God. We call him into our situations. And we believe that God is still good. God is always good. God cannot be anything but good. It is his nature. And we don't have to, we don't have to understand everything to continue to trust in him. Because if we fully know everything about God, there is no faith and there's no reason to even follow him. Because if he's, if he's enough for us to fully explain them, he's not big enough to be God. But there's areas that I don't know. There's areas I will die and not know. But it's me continuously pushing on asking the question to know who he is. Because it's the faith. It is, it is the faith that we have. That's what gets us through circumstances, through the good and the bad. God's word is true, whether my experience lines up with it or not. It's true. And we always go with God's word over our opinions because God's word is the truth. And that leads us to this. God's, God's not interested in as much in our happiness as he is in our holiness. John's learning this a different way. He's learning a different way. There I mean, there's countless stories of missionary after missionary after missionary who go out on the mission field. And they never come home. Because they're, they're murdered. They're taken, kidnapped, and held hostage never to be found again. You know, holiness and happiness, happiness is fleeting. I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. There, there are a lot of things in our garage at one point in time made us very happy. And now they just sit there. But joy is everlasting. And you know where joy comes from? Joy comes from a pursuit of holiness. And when we talk about holiness, holiness is becoming who you are made to be in Christ. One basic misconception about holiness is holiness is I'm holier than thou and I'm pretending to be something I'm not. That is not what holiness is. Holiness is lining up, looking at God, going, holy cow, I am not who I thought I was. 
It's like taking a dirty white tennis shoe that has been slung through the mud and putting it up against a brand new Nike white dunk. There's a, there's a big difference. And you realize that your shoes aren't as clean as you thought they were. This is what happens when we come into the holiness of God. We realize we are not as clean as we thought we were, that we, we are broken sinners that are, that are in need of a Savior. And if we will pursue holiness and becoming who Christ has made us to be, if we will dress ourselves with Christ's likeness, the work of the Spirit will gradually make our character more like His, and we will find true joy. And then we'll be able to say, I do want to be the hands and feet of Jesus, no matter what it costs, even if it costs my very life. And that's hard, isn't it? That's hard. When we look at John the Baptist's life, what we see is commitment and surrender to the calling of Jesus. That whatever it takes, however it takes, I'm here. That he had to get outside of a system to go out into a wilderness, to get along with God, to hear from God, to start proclaiming and preaching the gospel. And here's the most important thing about John the Baptist. That dude had to get out of the way. It would have been really easy for him to say, well, I've got, I've got 40 people in my small group. Look what i got right here. I'm, I'm a great small group leader. I, I have perfect attendance in serving in the kids' ministry. That, that's, that doesn't scream humility, does it? Salvation begins with humility of admitting I ain't got this that Jesus came and did for us what we could not do that he died on the cross for our sin and we have to recognize we are sinners every one of us can we just admit that all of us together that even on our best day God still loves us even on our worst day God still loves us because it doesn't change. And for John, his life didn't end the way that he thought. But here we are 2,000 years later reading these words of his and he is still preparing the way of the Lord. I'd say that's a legacy, wouldn't you? As we close, I just I want to take a moment just to, to call us into a place of, of repentance. Maybe for some of us this morning, we need to repent because we, we've been in good times and we've not given God thanks. Maybe our prayers always start with, God, I need you to, instead of God, thank you for. And maybe we need this morning to posture our hearts for thankfulness. Maybe we, we, need, we need to come to a place of repentance. And it's the cross of Jesus that, that we, we approach. And here's, here's what I'm learning. That when we come to the cross, that we can approach his throne with confidence. That he's not going to reject us. And I find, sometimes I find that so hard, even for myself, when I come to the cross, I, I get so worried that God's just going to say, you know what, I mean, it's a good try, but I'm good. I can, I'll find somebody else for the team. but he always gives us a thumbs up. And he always works through us and works with us so that we can prepare the way for others to know who Jesus is. And so this morning, if, if you have no relationship with Jesus, you're like, hey, listen, I am, <laughs> I've been going through life thinking I've got it, I can do it, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I know Jesus paid the debt for me, but I'm good, I got this. I'll just pay my own way. Let me tell you what the Bible says, that the, the wages of sin is death. Your payment will be death. That Jesus has already paid the price for you. And that gift is free. And so this morning, with every, if you'll just bow your head with me, and if, if you're there and like, hey, today I need to surrender my life to Christ. I have not done that. Just pray this with me. There's three things we do. We just admit, just tell God you're a sinner. That's the humility part. God, I'm a sinner. Maybe you're, you're like Paul. Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. God, I, I, I am a sinner. 
that I believe that you did for me on the cross what I couldn't do. And I believe that my sins are forgiven when I confess them to you. And I confess I'm a sinner and I need you and I need salvation. And if you prayed that prayer this morning, that is a prayer of surrender. I'm just going to ask if you do have a cross in the back and we'll have some of our prayer team and elders there that if you've made that prayer this morning, we want you to go public and make that. We want you to go speak with someone because you have a next step and we want to help you grow in that. So Jesus, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for the time that we've had in this room. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your word. And I just pray as we, God, I just pray as we move in these next few moments and sing and declare our praises to you of how good you are, that those who have surrendered their lives to Christ today will take that next step and they'll go speak with someone in the back. And we can help start to move and, and, and journey along with them. And I thank you for every life today that has been surrendered to you. And, and God, may you be glorified in all things. And I pray these things in your name.